just get into PowerPoint. So yeah, hi, uh, I'm Teresa Tannenbaum. Uh, thank you so much, Ellen, for inviting me to be here uh, at the Atlas Institute discussing my ideas around identity transformation through theatrical play. Um, today, I am going to be unpacking the idea of identity transformation as it has been conceptualized in digital media and game studies. Uh, but I'm going to be straying into other domains as well, including psychology, theater, uh, and digital media and learning. Uh, and I'm going to be drawing on several experiences of transformative theatrical play as examples, uh, beginning with an example from my own life. So last fall, I got to experience Twain, a single player pervasive game created by Jay Lee. Twain challenges its player to inhabit a present world where they once had a twin who has since gone away. To play this game, you must briefly revise your understanding of your own personal history. You begin by journaling about your fictional childhood with this twin following the writing prompts in the book. The game invites you to imagine the magical experiences you and your lost twin shared. And while Twain starts with you alone at home, it eventually takes you to a public space where you may choose whether or not you are going to reconnect with your missing sibling. The game asks you to set an alarm on your phone using your normal ringtone. You name this alarm after your lost twin, and when the alarm sounds, it is as if your phone is ringing and your sibling is calling you. It is your choice whether to answer that phone and perform a one-sided conversation with a lost piece of an imagined childhood. Twain's central mechanic is to enlist you into believing for a moment in an impossible past as if it were your own. Transgender game designer Avery Alder talks about this in terms of choosing to believe in the impossibilities. She argues that when the world is arranged to tell a story that robs you of any power, it is up to you to instead choose to tell yourself stories that restore that power. Much like Twain, Alder's games invite their players to inhabit alternative selves as they move through their daily lives. These acts of speculative remembering resonate profoundly with me because they mirror an act of reimagining my own past that I'm currently performing. As a transgender woman who waited 40 years before living openly as herself, I carry with me decades of memories from which I am increasingly dissociated. Who was the person I was before? How am I supposed to live a life without memories of me as myself? Twain restories the identity of the player. This idea comes from the intersection of learning theory and critical race theory. Restoring is a playful and critical memory practice described by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas and Amy Stornaiulo in which marginalized people, quote, narrate the self into existence by bending or otherwise reimagining the past. Such practices allow people to recenter themselves in the story of the world and reclaim agency through a form of creative narrativized practice. Mia Shaw at the University of Pennsylvania describes how this operates among high school students of color engaged in a process of designing electronic textile quilts. She writes, restoring can provide an opportunity for youth to not only reflect on the dominant narratives of CS, the ones that restrict who can and cannot participate, but to also use computational tools and practices to reimagine new connections to the field that are reflective of their intersecting social and cultural identities. Restoring provides a potential analytical framework for understanding youth of color's identification with CS through the development of counter narratives. Further, restoring provides a possible praxis for transformative action as youth reimagine alternative futures. And so, by reimagining alternative pasts and narratives of computation that center marginalized voices, youth of color can lay claim to identities that are typically denied to them as scientists, engineers, and programmers. This kind of identity work recognizes that the barriers to possible futures are both structural and also narrative. It is not enough to remove structural barriers to participation if we do not also create narratives by which historically oppressed peoples can envision themselves into a future free from oppression. My experience of Twain is an example of something I've spent my career pursuing, transformative play. It helps to illustrate how game design is nothing if not a framework for actively inhabiting new meanings and possibilities. 
but let me take a step back. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Informatics at UC Irvine, where I run a group called the Transformative Play Lab. We are a multidisciplinary group. We combine design research methods, close readings of games, and artistic practice and production. Our work often bridges digital and physical systems. We use tangibles, props, costumes, and environments in our design practice, and we design participatory narrative experiences inspired by performing arts practices. Most recently, I've been describing my work in terms of the design and study of playful XR experiences, where XR is a compound acronym that includes virtual, augmented, and mixed realities. In my work, I'd extend it to also include tangible, wearable, and embodied interactions. I have a background in theater and music, and so I draw on techniques from method actor training and the performing arts to inform my work. I'm generally fascinated by systems that give you a chance to experience a sense of identity transformation, perspective taking, and role play. I build and evaluate prototype interactive performance systems to explore the theoretical ideas behind transformative and theoretical play and or theatrical play, uh, which I'm going to be exploring today. And so I'm going to open with a brief discussion of the existing theories around transformation before digging deep into relevant theories of identity. I'll also be applying my own experience of personal transformation to this work as a critical lens for the first, for the first time, well, second time, this is the second time I've given this talk, uh, since coming out as a transgender woman. Uh, and we'll be using aspects of my own gender transition as a case study to work through some of the theoretical ideas we're going to discuss. I'll close by connecting all of this to the concept of theatrical play and exploring the implications of the, uh, these ideas, particularly for marginalized people. My transness is material to this discussion because for much of my career, it lurked in the background, inflecting and informing my work. Because I was in the closet about my gender, I always framed my work on transformative play in somewhat generic terms. The need to transform that was motivating me to pursue this direction was always unspoken. Its presence felt but unacknowledged. I was interested in transformation writ large but I was also interested in transformation because I so desperately needed to transform specific aspects of my life to more closely align with my own internal sense of my gender. Play and games were spaces where I could explore alternative experiences of self without shame or fear or risk. And while I lack formal research data on this, anecdotally, I can say that many of the transgender people I know had similar experiences with play and games. I actually found recently Celia Pierce and her research group found some evidence of this happening in virtual worlds as well. Uh, I also want to be clear that the old adage holds true here. Uh, if you have met one trans person, then you have met one trans person. So I, I'm speaking from my own experiences and no one else's. Uh, this, is, this is my perspective. But if my nascent transness informed my own interest in transformative play, I was fortunate to be in the field of games and digital media where the idea of transformation was already a central element of its core theories. This began with Janet Murray's Hamlet on the Holodeck, which is the foundational text for digital narrative studies. Murray described three fundamental aesthetics of digital media, immersion, agency, and transformation. Murray defines immersion as the sense of being contained within a space or state of mind that is separate from ordinary experience, more focused and absorbing and requiring different assumptions and actions like swimming when immersed in water. She defines agency as the satisfying power to take meaningful action and see the results of our decisions and choices. And for the purposes of time, I'm not going to go into either of these in depth in this talk, although I'm happy to discuss them at the end. Instead, I want to dig into transformation. Transformation hasn't received as much attention in game studies as agency or immersion. And this is in part because Murray doesn't provide a particularly coherent definition of the term. She describes it in terms of make-believe worlds, kaleidoscopic narratives, and instability. And as a result, transformation has always been the most difficult of these three concepts for designers to integrate into their practices. What is the subject of the transformation? Is it the identity of the player or the digital media itself or the feelings and perspectives of the player? What is the impact of the transformation? Is transformation a permanent state or a transitory one? I should also just claim that I'm not the first person to write about the idea of transformative play. Uh, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman in Rules of Play describe transformative play as a chaotic phenomenon that rewrites the rules of more rigorous game structures. The activities of play thus transform the game, Calvin Ball being an especially beautiful example of this. 
Jan Bach et al. take this idea further to consider how acts of play change the structures framing them, turning players into co-designers through the mere act of playing. In the digital media and learning space, Sasha Barab proposed a theory of transformational play as a process by which learners enlist academic content to transform problematic scenarios. This perspective positions play as a mechanism for transforming learners into empowered actors. Each of these approaches regards play as a tool through which players may transform the game or their environment. Of the three, only Barab's notion of transformational play has anything to say about the impact that play has on the identity of the player, but his work tends to be confined to educational context. I am interested first and foremost in personal transformation. I find these other theories of transformative play interesting and valuable, but ultimately dissatisfying. To start to understand the cognitive impact of media on a player, reader, or viewer, I looked outside of games, media, and play studies. In studies of the psychology of mediated experiences, there is this notion of being transformed by the media we consume. Green et al. in social psychology have described this in terms of transportation into narrative worlds, which they view as a primary pleasure of media. They view transformation as a process of self-expansion. Readers, viewers, players experience new identities, possible selves, and alternative life choices through media. And there is also evidence that media can transform our point of view and produce lasting experiences and insights into life, history, philosophy, and alternative perspectives. In cognitive science, Marr et al. argue that the emotional experiences that we have through fiction can result in both short-term and long-term transformations of our sense of self. Both of these approaches to transformation help describe the sensation that I find compelling. That sense of becoming someone or something else, of expanding your experience of self beyond what has been possible in your life. Sorry, I'm gonna make my phone quieter. Being able to describe this pleasure is an important first step. And we can hazard a preliminary definition of the kind of transformation that I'm talking about in my work. Transformation is the pleasurable experience of identifying with a character whereby a player adopts the intentions, desires, emotions, and motivations of that character. However, it is insufficient to simply describe. I'm interested in how we design for this kind of transformative play. And I'm interested in the implications that these kinds of transformative experiences have for our sense of ourselves. To understand this, we must not just understand transformation, but also identity. And identity is a slippery subject, in part because it is frequently subject in the negotiation with a social world that polices and gatekeeps which identities people are permitted to take on. And as a transgender woman, I know better than most that there is a really big gap between the identities that we can feel intrinsically and the identities that we are permitted to claim by the outside world. And this is because identity is both something that we are and something that we do in an ongoing negotiation of identity with people and infrastructures that are external to us. I thus find it useful to think about some aspects of identity as a form of compulsory labor. And to fully unpack what I'm thinking about here, I need to invoke another theorist, Dorothy Holland and her collaborators. Their notion of figured worlds is critical to understanding what I mean by identity labor. Holland et al. write about how we negotiate belonging within the various social identities that shape our lives. By figured world then, we mean a socially and culturally constructed realm of interpretation in which particular characters and actors are recognized, significance is assigned to certain acts and particular outcomes are valued over others. These collective as if worlds are socio-historic, contrived interpretations or imaginations that mediate behavior and so inform participants' outlooks. Holland et al. write, each is a simplified world populated by a set of agents. In the world of romance, attractive people, boyfriends, lovers, fiancés, who engage in a limited range of meaningful acts of changes of state, flirting with, falling in love with, dumping, having sex with, as moved by a specific set of forces, attractiveness, love, lust. And in this sense, our social figured worlds resemble the kinds of formal models of social behavior used in the digital interactive narrative community. And this is because to a certain extent, figured worlds are stereotypical. They are the simplifying social construct that we use to organize and distinguish between groups of people, 
we all inhabit multiple overlapping figured worlds in our lives, often playing different roles in each. There are two essential ideas within figured worlds theory for my work on identity. Uh, the first is that the social identities that we inhabit within these figured worlds are negotiated with others. If your identity is tied to a hobby, say playing video games, uh, then your ability to own that identity is often policed consciously or unconsciously by other people who feel that they share a stake in that identity. Certain behaviors and social signals become important for establishing credibility within a given claimed identity, and one's ability to conform to someone else's criteria for that identity often determines whether or not one is accorded it by others. Thus, we often see women in geek and gamer communities forced to overperform their cred in order to prove that they belong within the identity group and avoid being labeled fake geek girls. The second idea that Holland et al. introduce is the notion of mediating artifacts. And mediating artifacts are signifiers of belonging or desired belonging within a figured world. They write, figured worlds rely upon artifacts. Artifacts open up figured worlds. They are the means by which figured worlds are evoked, collectively developed, individually learned, and made socially and personally powerful. In many cases, these things are often subtle cues that people adopt as a result of in-group habitus. If everyone at your company wears button-up shirts and ties and you want to be accepted within their social space, then you are more likely to adopt similar clothing and style. However, more commonly, mediating artifacts help signify that you are on the inside, that you are aware of the norms through more intentional social signaling. If you've spent any time within LGBTQ plus communities, you've probably encountered the notion of the hanky code, whereby experience and interest in different sexual acts is signified to insiders by wearing a particularly colored handkerchief hanging out of a designated rear pocket. Mediating artifacts also have digital equivalents in online communities in the form of memes, emoji, and context specific languages. I'm going to take a moment to apply these ideas to something more concrete but also more personal, my own experience of the world as a transgender woman. And this is something that I've resisted speaking about explicitly in a professional context, but given the role that my gender identity has played in motivating this work, it warrants some consideration here. Gender transition produces a somewhat unique perspective on how our society regulates identity. My identity as a closeted trans woman informed my early work. Living through transition has given me a new perspective that I can apply to how our field understands identity and transformation. Transgender women often face a paradox when entering into the figured world of womanhood. If we are too feminine, we are told that we are caricatures of womanhood. If we are not feminine enough, we are told that we are simply deluded men playing dress up. In order to be accorded our correct identities in the world, we must thread a needle of gender performance. And I say this as someone who firmly believes in self-identification, the idea that your gender is whatever you say it is, independent of a particular set of behaviors, presentations, appearances, anatomical structures, DNA markers, or diagnoses from psychiatrists. Although belonging to a particular gendered identity category should be as simple as declaring one's belonging, many trans people struggle with how the figured worlds of their felt gender are gatekept and policed. It is often not enough to say, I am a woman. The figured world of womanhood has multiple social and legal constructs that trans women must negotiate. For me to claim that identity, I must prove it over and over and over and over again. And of course, we have no real empirical measure of someone's gender identity. You, you can't detect my transness with a blood test or by evaluating my answers to a standardized exam. Instead, the system of gatekeeping laid out in the WPATH standards of care insists that we obtain letters from psychiatrists who assess something deep and invisible inside of us over the course typically of like a conversation or two. These very literal gatekeepers to whom we have assigned responsibility to determine which trans people are deserving of gender affirming care use the figured worlds of femininity and masculinity as heuristics for determining whether a trans person is valid. Many stories of trans people having to overperform their felt gender in order to receive treatment uh, when they go uh, seeking gender affirming care. 
Trans people learn often the hard way that we need to overtly adopt the mediating artifacts that signal our transness and demonstrate our seriousness about transition. You may be a masculine of center trans woman, but if you want to get your letter for hormones, the received wisdom is that you need to wear a dress and makeup when meeting with your gender therapist. You may be a trans man who enjoys feminine gender expression, but there is substantial pressure to cut your hair short and bind your chest in order to be accorded manhood by the gatekeepers. Performances of gender are an important part of working the levers of the figured worlds of man and woman. And many trans people spend an extraordinary amount of energy coming to terms with the consequences of those signifiers. And for non-binary people, this is infinitely more complicated as hard as it is to find a trans affirming therapist and doctor, it is even harder to find one who isn't fundamentally entrenched in binary notions of male and female. And this is just to gain access to medical care and legal resources for correcting our documentation to reflect our identities. As hard as those figured worlds are to navigate, they pale in comparison to the figured worlds of gender that we encounter during daily social interaction. There is a reason why a generation of feminists had to embrace a raft of masculine gender performances. Uh, oh, skipped a thought. As we live in a world that rewards behaviors that it regards as masculine and punishes behaviors that it sees as feminine. Um, there's a reason why a generation of feminists had to embrace masculine gender performances and stereotypes in order to start to claw back power from the patriarchy. The, the women's power suit with shoulder pads was a critical mediating artifact for career-oriented women trying to claim their own power in an environment that only had use for women as a subservient class. And likewise, certain mediating artifacts that signal femininity, skirts, dresses, jewelry, makeup, uh, are fiercely denied to boys and men, lest they be perceived as weak. And this brings us all back to identity labor. And I'm framing this in terms of labor because for many trans women in the early days of our transitions, the signifiers of femininity are profoundly time consuming. In the first weeks and months of my transition, I had to spend an hour a day just removing unwanted hair. Hormones are slow, slow medicine and people who are perceived as male who present in feminine ways are subject to ridicule, discrimination and violence. And nothing in our society codes someone as masculine more visibly than a dark full shadow of facial hair. The labor of foregrounding my femininity to the world has thankfully diminished over time, thanks to 18 months on hormones and a long slow period of letting go of the many masculine performances and affectations that I had taken on in order to survive back when I was allowing people to perceive me as a man. Still, ever since starting my transition, it is hard not to view my social identity as a project under construction. And this brings me to another piece of theory on identity that I want to touch on today. In his foundational work, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy, Jim Gee introduces the notion of projective identity. He first makes a distinction between the identity of the player and the identity of the character in the game. He then elaborates on the possible relationships between the player and the character, identifying three identities that arise between them, the virtual, the real, and the projective. The first two are self-evident. The virtual identity is the fictional identity of the character as represented within the media. It is reflected in the visual representation of the character, the narrative and personality details supplied to the player, and the mechanical and statistical models that the character is built upon. The real identity is that of the player with all of their skills, competencies, knowledges, preferences, and experiences. These things can inform many aspects of how the player approaches the character. However, it is much less interesting to me than the projective identity. This is where the virtual and the real identities meet. It is the way in which the player projects themselves into the character, using the character as a proxy for themselves and experiencing the character's fears, desires, and struggles as their own. This is an especially useful way to think about the identities at stake during play experiences, especially from a, pers from a perspective of transformation. It creates a clearly demarked mechanism by which the player can experience the things that the character experiences without losing themselves in the game. But there is a second meaning of projective identity that I find even more compelling. This is projective in the sense of a project or undertaking, a projective identity. This connects back to the idea of identity labor that I've been discussing. 
From this perspective, the character becomes a site for the aspirations of the player, a project into which the player invests effort in order to develop it into something that is a blend of the real and virtual identities, but directed by the player's ambitions for the character. I've been thinking about trans identity as a project a lot since starting on this journey. Part of Guy's framework, parts of Guy's framework map directly to what I am experiencing as I transition. Other aspects of the framework fall short or fail to capture the nuances of transitioning. Certainly, Tess is a project, one which entails me into labor of developing new perspectives, expectations, understandings, and practices. But in other ways, Tess isn't about developing a separate character. It's about peeling away layers of a fictional player identity that I've performed for decades in order to finally get to exist as myself in the world. This is also a form of labor, but one of letting go of habits and coping mechanisms that I created in order to maintain a passing masculine identity. The project then is about collapsing player and character into some sort of self that can always exist without having to practice the labor of asserting this projective identity. And this brings me at last to theater. When I first started working on the idea of identity transformation, I kept coming back to my own experiences in, and training and acting. In my previous work, I've drawn out the connections between players on a stage and players in a game. Games and theater are both processes of structured enactment by which a player performs a creative act that is immediate and believable within a set of prearranged scripts, behaviors, and constraints. I've spent many years looking at how actors are taught to experience a sense of transformation into their characters in order to better understand how we might design experiences of play to produce similar sensations of identity transformation. Actors experience something that method acting theorist Peter Lobdell describes as a paradox of identity. They are simultaneously themselves and the character. They exist on the stage as technicians and artists employing the skills of their craft and also as living fictional entities feeling and enacting the reality of the show in a way that is immediate, visceral, and profound. David Saltz talks about acting in terms of borrowed intentions and argues that the speech acts performed on stage take on a reality within the context of the play, similar to how the commitments of players in a game take on a reality within the context of the game. Thus, two actors might profess deep love for each other on stage, and in that moment, that love is pure and real. But then both actors return to their own lives and loves off stage. Similarly, two game players may swear violent hatred of each other during a match, and then happily go out for beers afterwards and celebrate each other's victories. Within the magic circle of the game or the stage, the rules governing the play uh, give that play a reality but it doesn't always extend outside of that space. It is worth noting, however, that these boundaries are not always impermeable. In the Nordic LARP traditions, there is a concept known as bleed. Bleed was coined to describe situations where the emotions of the player or the characters in a live action role-playing game bleed over into each other. An example is when the players performing characters in love come to experience real romantic feelings for each other, or when players who dislike each other in real life inevitably end up performing their roles so that their characters are also antagonistic towards each other. Bleed speaks to the power of enacted experiences to produce consequential outcomes in the lives of their actors. It shows that the identity play of games and theater can have real emotional and identity stakes. One way to understand this phenomenon is through what Kurt Daw describes as the creative state. Daw writes, acting is creating a sense of life. Actors create this sense of life, not by manipulating appearances, but by experiencing the action as it occurs. They are in the here and now, a state where concentration on the details of the moment preclude the distractions of the past or future. This creative state is one in which the identity of the actor is suspended and they are moving, acting, thinking, and being as the character. To use Guy's terminology, the real identity is on hold while the virtual and projective identities move into the foreground. Interestingly, method actors achieve this state of immediacy not through long hours of contemplation of their characters, but instead by training themselves to react to stimuli in the moment. Sanford Meisner described this as the reality of doing, 
the actors don't pretend to feel or do the actions they portray. They actually feel and do the things that happen on the stage. Meisner points out that people believe behavior over words. If a person is behaving in a way that is threatening to you, it doesn't matter if they are saying reassuring things. You respond to their actions. You learn to distrust their words. Meisner's process is famous for a repetition exercise in which actors repeat the same words to each other back and forth, learning to read and respond to the behaviors behind those words. And Robert Benedetti describes how actors use a form of outside in behavior to arrive at a cognitive transformation. He argues that the secret to acting is to just do the things that the character does as if you actually care about them, a process that inevitably ultimately leads to an internal transformation into a character. A final bit of acting theory that is relevant here is known as mask work. Masks have been used as a transformative medium for all of recorded human history, all the way back to primordial rituals. Several historical theatrical traditions have formalized mask work, including Italian Commedia dell'arte and Japanese no theater. In mask work, as Keith Johnstone describes it, an actor puts on a mask and is shown their new face in a mirror. And seeing a new face is a catalyst for an almost trance-like abandonment of ego and a transformation into the character depicted by the mask. Interestingly, masks have their own characters and these characters tend to be consistent even when performed by multiple actors in this way. Uh, in this way, a mask operates like a material script for outside in transformation. Johnstone writes, it is not surprising then to find that masks produce changes in the personality or that the first sight of oneself wearing a mask and reflected in a mirror should be so disturbing. You feel that the mask is about to take over. In a mask class, you are encouraged to let go and allow yourself to become possessed. Masks in this instance can serve as a form of mediating artifact, a visual signifier that produces membership to the figured world of the character that it contains and the concomitant behaviors and perspectives associated with that role. These techniques represent a rich thread of practice upon which to build experiences of play that can produce similarly transformative outcomes for their players. And it has been my work over the last few years to develop and evaluate experimental systems of transformative play that put these ideas into practice. And so I want to close by trying to pull all of these threads together. In my mind, everything we have discussed thus far is connected. Games and digital media have the power to produce a sense of identity shift, a transformation of our perspectives and experiences into something new. The identities we inhabit are contingent and negotiated. We don't get our identities automatically, but as a result of our ability to operate the mediating artifacts and signifiers that demonstrate our belonging within the social figured world of any given identity that we hope to inhabit. This same negotiation happens in games where our identity becomes entangled with the characters that we invest ourselves into. When we perform identities through play, we can draw on practice and insight from theater to understand how those enacted roles become real, temporarily erasing our initial sense of self and potentially producing transformed selves that extend beyond the experience of play. These experiences of transformative theatrical play have a profound power to create possibility models that are emancipatory. When we inhabit new identities, we create possibilities where there were none before. We restory our lives into new configurations that allow us to reclaim lost power. My aspiration for transformative play is as a mechanism for radical empowerment of marginalized and oppressed peoples. I played Twain in the first few months of my gender transition. It was devastating, inspiring, profound, and emotional. The game allowed me to confront the many ways in which I'd run away from my gender identity in the past. It gave me a framework to begin to redeem a childhood that already was growing fraught with remembered trauma of dysphoria and disconnection. My final moments of playing Twain happened on a public lookout in my suburban Irvine neighborhood as the sun was setting. I stood facing the west as the autumn winds whipped around me and I begged for my lost sister to call me. I paced, I cried, and when my phone rang, I answered in a broken voice and I promised her I would not forget my own magic this time, the gift that I'd thrown away as a child, the gift that puberty had stolen from me. I promised her that I would this time, I would not let anyone else tell me who I was supposed to be. Uh, 
and that is my talk. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'm excited about the conversation we're about to have. It was much faster than I expected, so we have lots of time to chat. I thought for sure this is going to be an hour. Here we are. Um, yeah. How is everyone doing? I'm going to try to get the chat visible so I can see what's happening. So uh, any questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, I think we have quite a bit of time to, to have a conversation about these ideas. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a bit more of a personal talk that I, I typically give. Um, yeah, hi, Tess, I have a question. Uh, first of all, just thank you so much for, th this was just a really rich area that you've clearly done so much work in on so many levels. And um, I really appreciate how much of your story you were willing to share with us. Um, and that's actually what my question is about. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the positionality of researchers and how you make those kinds of discerning decisions to incorporate your personal experiences into your analysis um, and recognize where your positionality um, is valuable to your research. It's a really good question. Uh, so my training is in humanities. Primarily, my, my training comes from my, my my senior advisor was a game was a film scholar who was trained by Henry Jenkins, who was trained by David Bordwell. And so, like my my sort of my lineage of scholarship goes back to like film theory, uh, and and film theory and humanities theory tends to use hermeneutic and critical methods to assess a text, to assess a media artifact, to assess an experience, and. For a long time, there was this attempt within hermeneutics to try and erase the positionality of scholars, to, to try to strive for some sort of scientific objectivity, some sort of attempt at, uh, I think uh, Husserl called it phenomenological reduction, the, the attempt to like reduce the persona of the researcher down to nothing so that you could get at the pure experience of the text. And uh, Gadamer, uh, Gadamer's uh, sort of philosophical hermeneutics pushed back against this, and it led to a reopening of hermeneutics as a methodology that was ultimately about the situatedness of the reader, about the positionality of the scholar, and about their identity, uh, and about the disclosure of the perspective from which something was being read. And so if one was uh, exploring a text through a lens of Marxist theory or feminist theory or post-feminist or post-structuralist theory, those were salient to what gets read, what gets attended to, uh, what details are, are drawn out of the text and, and centered uh, in the analysis. And so the, the more recent trend within these critical methods has been about reflecting on one's own relationship to the scholarship and incorporating that into it, putting it in conversation with it. Um, the kinds of claims you can make from these perspectives are different from the kinds of claims you make from a, a more objectivist perspective. Like we're not, like, like when you're doing a subjectivist work, you, you don't make universal claims. You don't make generalizable claims. You, you make claims that are situated. You make claims that are context specific. You say, if you read this in this way, from this point of view, you will see these things. You can extract this value from the text when you see these things. This is a way of reading it, not this is what it means. And so you, you sacrifice a certain degree of certainty uh, in order to be able to speak about things that are personal, that are connected to ethos and values and aesthetics and, and all these sort of bigger human ideas that don't reduce well into more empiricist and positivist methods. Uh, and so like for me, it's been interesting to have to look back on my previous work where it's my, my positionality as, as a transgender woman is, is evident there, uh, even when I wasn't entirely aware of what was happening and wasn't open to myself about what was going on. I can see the threads running through my old work in coming out it changes how I understand my previous writing and it changes like that positionality alters the nature of the scholarship that I've produced. And in some ways this talk has been one of my first attempts to reconcile my new understandings and perspectives with, with the work that I've done throughout my career. 
uh, and to try to find that coherent, consistent thread that runs through it. I don't know if that fully answers your question. Um, I value perspective. I value positionality. I, I, I try to get my students to to reflect upon their own situatedness as, as readers and as scholars, because we ultimately can't put that aside. Like we can't stop being ourselves. We can imagine perspectives. That's something that, that Jim Bazoki and I have done uh, in our work on close reading. Um, we, we talk about a sort of projective phenomenology or a, an imagined persona. And it's something HCI researchers do and UX researchers do when they design from personas. Um, you, you imagine yourself into a particular point of view, a particular perspective, and then you try to design for that point of view. And, and your capacity to succeed at that is a function of how familiar you are with that perspective and how effectively you've, you've mentally simulated the, the actual needs of, of that person you're imagining. Yeah, go ahead. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively new to the group, so I apologize. I, I won't do it. Uh, a lot of this conversation, thank you so much, Tess, has been about uh, character and persona and identity. Uh, but something you talked about early on uh, is narrative. Uh, and I'm really interested in that. Uh, partly because I really don't know when people use the word narrative what they're talking about, uh, because to me it's just a story, but sometimes it seems to be much more theoretical and structural. But the, the more salient question for me today is um, something that I came across in a paper by Galen Strawson, a uh, philosopher, and he said, does the fundamental sense of oneself have a distinctly narrative character? And that's my question for you. I mean, from my perspective, it absolutely does, in part because uh, I'm going to answer your first question as well in order to answer this, this question. Um, I, sub I subscribe to a perspective on narrative that sees it as a cognitive strategy for sense making uh, in the world. Uh, that and some of this goes back to, um, who is it? Narrative is reality. Uh, classic psychology, Jerome Bruner um, wrote about the idea that we use narrative as a perceptual frame to whittle away on important details of our perception in order to make sense of the overwhelming sensorium of our existence in the world. That we're, we're being hit with data constantly. Like our senses are taking in all sorts of stuff, very little of which actually turns out to be meaningful for our understanding of the world or our decision-making processes, our ability to relate to each other. And that in order to decide which data to pay attention to, in order to decide which of our, which details in our sensorium matter, we apply logics to, to reduce, to simplify, to attend to specific things and disregard other things. And those logics operate along narrative lines. That, that narrative is a cognitive tool that we use to both shape and reflect upon our understanding of, of our sensory experiences in the world. And then more crucially, to structure and communicate those understandings to each other, because ultimately, we can't know what's in somebody else's head. I can't know whether the, the person I see on the screen in front of me is, is a living, thinking, feeling human, or whether they are a computer simulation or a cardboard stand-up or, or a, a hallucination caused from a bad piece of cheese that I ate last night. Um, I, don't, I, I can't know that. And yet, because we are able to produce stories and structure information in a way that adheres to a set of causally connected logics. We are able to exchange information from inside each other's heads uh, that then leads us to be able to reach a reasonable conclusion that actually, yes, you are a human being. Yes, I am talking to a person. Yes, we are both people that, that have a shared experience of this reality. Um, and so for me, narrative is a data structure. Narrative is an organizational principle. It's, it's one of the earliest human technologies. It's a human technology that, that predates almost any other technology that, that we have developed since. 
and it is fundamental to how we make sense of our world and then how we communicate that. Uh, it is why things like restoring are so important to me because we, we see how narrative is used to produce social power. We see how narrative is used to center certain people and, and decenter other people. And so uh, the, one of the most sort of pressing examples of this right now is the, the ways in which American education systems fail to actually communicate the realities of slavery uh, at the founding of the country. Uh, the, the ways in which the stories that we tell about the history of this country fail to actually incorporate a full understanding of what was done to black people, to indigenous people in order to produce the, the power structures uh, that underlie our democracy. And those stories are so threatening, they're so dangerous to our status quo that Trump's administration uh, released a gag order. They released a ban on talking to any federal or state employees about them um, uh, near the end of the, the administration, something that Biden's only just recently reversed. And so the stories we tell about our world, they produce power. The, the stories that we collectively agree to invest ourselves in as the norm, as the truth, those produce material consequences that, that affect who has health care, who doesn't, who has access to housing, who doesn't, whose voice gets to be heard, who gets to produce culture, uh, who gets to have a say in the public conversation, who is shuffled to the sides of civic life. And, and so I'm, I'm interested in narrative and storying in part because I see it as the best path to resisting hegemonic and oppressive systems, the best way to, to change systems of power that unfairly oppress people uh, for, for no reason except for the fact that they've been historically not included in the norm. Um, that was maybe a dead denser, darker response than, than you expected, but that's, that's, those are the stakes as far as I'm concerned. Um. Thanks. See, I, I don't think you have to raise your hand. I think you can just just talk if you've got something to say. I would be curious to hear from Julia. I think she's talking about sublime and game and virtual reality. Julia, are you there? Yeah, hi. There, there. Um, yeah, super interesting talk. Um, yeah, I mean, all of this is very relevant to stuff that I've been working on relating to virtual reality and um, different philosophical concepts, but most recently the sublime and whether the first person experience of being inside a virtual environment can create a genuine experience of the sublime. So um, super interesting. I'm not sure I have a specific question though. <laughs> I mean, that reminds me of the stuff that I think it was Eric Champion did on, on extern theory in virtual worlds. So like extern theory, I think it comes from like social anthropology. It's, it's the sensation of experiencing one's smallness in the face of the majesty of the universe, the grandeur of the world. It's that, that feeling of like standing in the desert at night and looking up at the Milky Way as it spins above you and, and realizing exactly how tiny you are. Uh, and he talks a lot about the ways in which virtual worlds can produce this kind of virtual externality, this, this virtual sense of being confronted with a, a world that is bigger than your ability to comprehend. Um, Jonathan Alexander at uh, UC Irvine actually talks a little bit about this as well in terms of virtual reality. Um, he, he's interested especially in the ways in which people can generate longing for, for imagined worlds. And so he, he writes a lot about 
the the culture that grew up around James Cameron's Avatar, where where people uh, felt homesick for for the world in Avatar. They 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 felt such a it was such a compelling aesthetic experience that that people now see their so their folks that see themselves as like Navi spirit, right? That they they have chosen to believe that they're embodiments of this thing because it represents something that produces a pang of homesickness, of longing, of desire. Uh, that that it's being homesick for a place that never existed. Uh, and that's really powerful. And that's something that, that media has the capacity to do, whether it be a virtual reality or even just a film. Um, Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of my PhD students is looking at enchantment right now as a concept. Um, his, his background is in historical musicology and Western esotericism and, and occult studies. Uh, and he's, he's looking at systems of magic and play and, and specifically the, the notion of, of enchantment and disenchantment as it's been used both in, in occult studies and also in, in studies of digital media. Very cool. Actually, can I just riff on that uh, since we have a couple of moments? Oh, yeah. uh, since you mentioned enchantment, Tess, I've, I've recent, so I've been very interested in um, when people say something takes on a life of its own, like a company or a movement or whatever, to actually to see what happens when you take that literally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, corporate personhood, you know, Julie is a lawyer, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, to some extent, it's a metaphor. Um, and so I've ended up re reading in Western esotericism about something called egregores, mm. uh, which are, you know, ways in which people actually follow rituals and construct entities and maintain entities bigger than themselves. Uh, and these things have real power. Uh, and I wondered if the work that you were described sort of was looking at the collective consequences of enchantment. Uh, certainly, I don't know that Mikhail's work specifically has has engaged with that, but it, it certainly connects to the things that we're talking about. Um, the, just the idea of figured worlds is this this collective agreement that a a scientist looks like this is this that we we collectively invest the notion of what a scientific identity is with these these details and these specifications, these expectations, these practices, and those then allow us to say this person is a scientist, this person isn't a scientist. Um, and, and those things have consequences, right? There's this great study from, uh, I'm gonna forget their names now, it was on enclosed cognition that looked at people performing science tasks wearing lab coats and people performing science tasks in street clothes and the lab coats materially and measurably improved their performance of the science task because they were invested with this, this narrative of meaning. Uh, one of the things that I was exposed to as a graduate student was uh, one of my professors, Naranjan Raja, did work on post-traditionalist media. And he was specifically looking at how to draw epistemic frameworks from outside the Western world in order to find ways of thinking that didn't fall into the traps of, of sort of postmodern meaninglessness. And one of the, the frameworks that he introduced me to was from a book on the lives of Indian images that, that looked at how statuary and reliquary and, and God figures would move through cultures and take on lives of their own. So it would start out create you would have a Buddha statue that was created for one purpose and it would it would it would live inside a temple. And in that situation within the community of practice around it, it would take on a, a set of meanings, a set of significances, a set of feelings, a set of behaviors. But then that culture would shift, the temple might be destroyed, the statue may float down a river and be adopted by another village and take on a new life. And so these, these material artifacts have histories and lives that are both the lives and histories of the people investing themselves into them and, and producing this, I don't remember the term that you used, but uh, it, it is this idea. Um, and also these histories and lives that extend beyond the specific practices that happen to be situated around them in any given moment. Um, it's, it's something that people do. And it's something that as, as somebody who uh, practices magic in her daily life, uh, who came back to, to magical practice and, and to witchcraft uh, after transitioning, after sort of feeling 
no longer excluded from sort of the idea of sacred femininity, the things about magic that I find compelling and powerful are about that investiture of meaning into, into the ordinary, that, that, that choice to regard something as, as significant, uh, whether or not that significance is, is tied to any kind of external source. The, the, the power of human intention to take chaos and to take this undifferentiated sensorium and designate significance and meaning within it. And so much of our social life is connected to that. We had one of the students whose committee I was on, he was one of Jeff Bowker's students, Aubrey Slaughter. He did his dissertation work on supernatural practices of computing, specifically looking at how magical communities and magical practitioners construed the operations of magic and how computer users uh, produced superstitions and, and magical thinking and reasoning around what was happening inside their computer at any given time. And, and that, that attempt at divining meaning from the unknowable is very parallel. That I don't know how many of y'all do this when your computer freezes up, you wiggle the mouse and you, you hope that wiggling the mouse is gonna wake it up. And then maybe you wiggle the mouse and it doesn't work. And, and then you control out delete a few times, you hit caps lock to see whether the caps lock light turns on. And these are, these are, these are diagnostic rituals. They're diagnostic superstitions. Um, and it's, it's this way in which we continue to think magically despite having all of the scientific knowledge at our disposal, having all of this empirical knowledge at our disposal, at the end of the day, like there is the sense that maybe I don't want to uh, do this thing because it's going to jinx me in some way. Uh, actors are, uh, and yeah, I can absolutely share a link to, to Aubrey's dissertation because it's beautiful work. Um, like, like the other thing that this connects to is, is the work on restoring and, and the work that Avery Alder talks about that I presented at the beginning. Uh, Avery is a transgender game designer and one of the games that she produced before coming out and transitioning was called Teen Witch. And Teen Witch is a game in which it's a single player pervasive game. You play it alone, you play it in a quiet space in your home. And in order to play it, the precondition is that you must become a teenage girl who is also a witch. And that is the first step. The first rule of the game is be a teenage girl who is a witch. And you have to find your way into that possibility space, into that belief in order to then play the game. And what Alder writes and talks about in her work around her design is that she's interested in choosing the narratives that give us our voices back, that give us power back, that when you are a member of a marginalized group, when you're a member of an oppressed group, you're told that the things that you want, that the paths to power that you desire are impossible. Your, your life becomes bounded and shaped by impossibilities. Uh, you, you live within a world where the narratives of, of who can do what and who can be seen and who can be cared for tend to exclude you, tend to include, exclude people like you. And because everything is impossible, because you are impossible, it frees you to choose to believe in the impossibilities that empower you. It, it frees you to choose to believe in impossible things that give you agency in your life, in the world. And it's such a deeply trans understanding of the world because for anybody to transition, we have to first come to terms with this thing which we have been told is impossible. We have to come to terms with the fact that despite every piece of evidence available to our senses, every message that has been given to us by the world, uh, that this thing that we know to be true, this impossible thing is real and it is going to be made real in our social space and, and in our environment and in our lives. And in doing so, you do this impossible thing and suddenly you realize if I could make this impossibility real, what else have I been told about what is real that, that actually is, or what isn't possible that actually is possible? What else has the world told me about what has to be and what the status quo requires that I can question, that I can challenge, that I can reinvent? Um, and it's, it's an idea that I'm still working on building my own sort of theoretical perspective on. Right now I'm drawing on, on other people whose work I find really inspiring. Um, 
but it is, I think, in some ways, the, the work I'm moving towards. How do we create experiences of play that allow people to identify the impossibilities that are limiting them and tell new stories for themselves and empower them? That's magic. I'm going to, while I'm on the phone, I'm going to dig up Aubrey's dissertation just so that I can pop a link in the chat. Um, because it is good stuff. Um, Just one more random thought. Um, Pierre mentioned the law earlier, and I've for a long time just kind of had the feeling that the law, magic, and computer programming are the exact same thing, just kind of in different formats. 100%, and, yes. <laughs> And for me, I've been thinking about the common thread there as being something along the lines of John Austin's paper called How to Do Things with Words. And there are just these different things that we've kind of set up and maybe they start out as fictions like the law, but then we've created these elaborate structures that turn simple words into things that actually have a lot of causal power. Yeah. Um, I don't, just, just oh, but no, I mean, like, the, and that connects to, uh, I've done a lot of work with speech act theory, um, uh, which has some problematic roots, but is ultimately about the fact that words and language and communication are consequential, um, that they're, they're not simply, you know, this ephemeral exchange of ideas, but actually language is action in the world that it, it entails the speaker in certain commitments. It, it entails the world in these, in, in, in thing, into material consequences. And so something as simple as a judge pronouncing a sentence on somebody, that, that speech, that speech that carries consequences because of the systems of, of law that we've built up around it. Uh, somebody saying, I now pronounce you, uh, you know, wife and wife, I, I now pronounce you married, uh, is something that, that carries with it actual legal consequences. These speeches change the material nature of our world because we've chosen to invest them with meaning. It's also, I think, not accidental that if you look at the histories of, of legal judgment and, and legal juridical uh, hermeneutics, uh, that they're rooted in histories of theological hermeneutics, that, that the same practices by which we argued and built relevance and meaning around theological texts then became the basis for our production of legal texts that are, for a long time, hermeneutics was purely the study of either legal doctrine or religious doctrine. Uh, and, and there's a reason, and, and like hermeneutics is ultimately subjective, right? It's ultimately situated and constructed. And it's, it's about producing a responsive body of reflection upon the law that fits the particular needs of a situation, which is why like the, the Supreme Court issues opinions. Uh, they're, they're, they're weighted opinions, but they're, they're not fact. They're, they're, they're the opinion on the, the interpretation of the law as it applies within our current context and situation. That's why they get revisited. Um, this is the basis for knowledge claims in the work that I do, this idea that through these practices of reflection and interrogation, uh, we can collectively arrive at meaning that arises from us and, and from our own experience of, of text and our own ability to consent on it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, no, it's, it's a very good connection. Uh, it's also it's also really important because it highlights the <clears throat> the supreme fictionality of the legal structures that we, we live within, uh, and this is something that I mean, like I'll, I'll bring it back to being trans because this is the perspective I, I'm bringing to things. Um, before I came out, I existed within a legal framework that was designed to protect and preserve my rights. Uh, I, I existed as a person who was legible to our, our legal systems. I existed as a person who could reasonably expect that the laws would protect my interests. I was, you know, I was perceived as, as a white male straight person, um, which is to say the person that our, our system of laws is designed to protect, preserve, celebrate, support. And 
when I transitioned and when I came out, th th I am still a, the same person. I'm still deserving of those protections and support uh, from the law, uh, but I no longer receive them. Uh, I, I lost huge chunks of, of basic civil rights and protections under the law uh, as a result of simply declaring myself uh, to be not the person that people thought I was when I was born. And in doing so, I, I lost the, I, up until this most recent Supreme Court case ruling in June, uh, I lost protection at a federal level from employment discrimination uh, from housing discrimination and, and from discrimination within healthcare, um, which up until last week was still true, that, that it's only been in the last like five days that I've regained a federal guarantee against discrimination in healthcare. Um, and so my humanity and my rights and the rights of people like me are, they're the subject of a political debate rather than than something that is grounded in any sort of baseline assumptions about how humans should be treated and how humans should be valued in our society. That we still live in a society that decides which humans uh, are given basic civil rights and which humans are not. That, that we, we, we believe that our society is empowered to choose which humans are more human than others. Um, and that's, that for me makes it a lot harder to blindly comply with the law because it's the, the ways in which the law is designed to make me invisible or erase me uh, are, are much more apparent to me now than they were, you know, 20 months ago. It also, it's, you know, when you, when you realize that we live within a tapestry of different legal uh, regimes in this country where as I move from state to state, I, I gain and lose certain civil rights. Uh, many states still have uh, walking while trans laws, which is a sort of colloquial way of talking about stop and frisk laws or, or laws where uh, simply by being in public as a trans person, usually as a trans person of color, uh, police are entitled to arrest you, question you and detain you um, on suspicion of sex work. Uh, because trans people are generally seen to uh, be potentially in violation of this particular norm. Um, whether or not you, you happen to be engaged in sex work, uh, as somebody who's sex work positive, I, I, I find the, the whole idea that you would arrest somebody for this ludicrous, but here we are. Uh, we still have laws in 29 states that preserve the gay panic and the trans panic defense. So, if I were to go on a date with somebody and, and that person did not know that I was trans and at some point in the date, uh, I disclosed my, my gender identity at birth to that person and that person murdered me, uh, they would in 29 states in the United States, that person could claim that they were so upset by discovering that I was trans that the only, that they lost control of themselves, the only response available to them was to murder me and they would be released. Uh, and, and this is more than half of the United States have laws in the books that protect people who murder trans people uh, using a trans panic defense. And so it's, it's, very, it's very evident to people like me um, that, that our laws are constructs designed to preserve certain systems of power at the expense of others. Um, but there's magical thinking. And it's stories, it's also narratives. Hey Tess, I had a question for you. Hi. Hey, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much. Uh, your talk was incredible and uh, really appreciate your perspective. Um, my question kind of lies within the realm of music Mm -hmm. um, as a musician and someone who mm -hmm. desires to <laughs> bring music into the spaces to either incorporate play or think about narratives um, in some way in self-expression, I was just kind of wondering what your take is on music and how you incorporate that in your work. I mean, I'm, I'm writing an autobiographical musical right now, if that counts. Um, I'm, uh, I, I used to be a professional singer back before grad school. I used to sing with a magical group. Um, I had a cod piece, it was very strange. Um, and 
Uh, I mean, like, there's so much stuff connecting music and trance and ritual and identity that I feel like that's a whole other talk. Uh, and it's something that I haven't dug into too deeply. I, I've worked on, I work on a lot of projects around music production and virtual reality and, and around music around music performance and in virtual reality. Oh, goddess, karaoke. That's right. We did that. Y'all have this amazing karaoke bar also in Boulder. It's extraordinary. Um, but the, like, so I, one of the current projects I'm working on is a virtual reality digital audio workstation. And, and the idea here is to take the, uh, and this is less connected identity, more connected sort of play and sound, uh, to take the aspects of music production and creation and sound production and creation that have been made abstract and widgetized through the sort of the history of analog digital audio workstations leading to digital workstations leading to sort of just like these, mm -hmm. these you know, buttons and knobs and faders style of interacting with sound and re-physicalize it in virtual reality. So the, the example that, that connects to people most easily is when you produce uh, reverberation in uh, a digital audio workstation, you have like a room size knob that you turn and you have like a reflectivity of the surfaces thing that you can set and you, you control your wet dry mix. And, and what you're doing is you're producing a, a digital simulation of if you were to take that sound and place it inside of a space that happened to have these reverberant properties. In our design, you actually walk into a room and you play your sound and you have a crank that allows you to change the size of the room around you uh, and then sample how that sound sounds in that virtual space. If you want to dampen the space, you slap shag carpet up on the walls. If you want to liven the space, you put marble paneling on the walls. The space, if you want to change how standing waves and reflections work, you change the angles of the surface in it. And so it, it stops being this abstract widget and instead becomes this experience of, of how the sound works. And, and the argument we're making here is, first of all, that it's playful, that it helps people sort of visualize the physics of acoustics when they're, they're producing sound, but also that the tools that we use to create art change the kinds of art we create. You're going to make something different with a crayon than you are with 3D Studio Max or Blender. You're going to make something different with oil paints you're going to make with Lego, um, that, that we've been producing sound through these interfaces that you know, we, we, there are variations like Moog has some fun toys and there are these, these fun sort of new instruments out there. But the, the work of producing audio tends to come back to these skeuomorphic interfaces that have their roots in analog electronics as we're trying to rethink that with this project. Um, Kind of, it's one of the things I haven't talked about much in this talk, but it is, it is one of my, my most active projects at the moment. That's fascinating, thank you. I also have a piece I'm doing with a Broadway producer who, who's an alum of our program that I've been collaborating with for about three years, uh, where we are doing virtual reality musical theater karaoke for the Broadway community. And uh, we're, we're trying to, we, we actually, we've created a pretty fantastic prototype that's meant to be deployed in the lobby of a Broadway show where you are in VR singing and you're controlling a, a puppeteered character who's on a public screen and your voice is through a PA and the Broadway audience is watching you and they're controlling a virtual audience inside virtual reality that is responding to your performance, taking uh, app-driven feedback from them. And, and it's this, this sensory experience of stepping onto a Broadway show, but you're doing it in front of an actual Broadway audience and getting to sort of live that dream of getting pulled out of the audience and put on stage in your favorite show. Uh, that one that one went on pause with COVID. That was one that we we, we, we had to, like, like once Broadway shut down, our, our venues for disseminating that, that suddenly cut in half. Uh, but we're, I'm, I'm looking at ramping it up again as, as we re-enter the world. And then, yeah, I'm writing a show. Yes, love it. Well, maybe you can find a way to work on it. <laughs> Virtual, physical, I, yes. I agree with Katie, like this is dying. <laughs> we want physical, we want immersive, we want experience, but what is real? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I had just blocked out how many shows I missed with my subscription to the Denver Center in the past oh, year. Oh, <laughs> I know. It's heartbreaking. 
Uh, I know so many people in this community are struggling right now because mm -hmm. there's just like like there's no way to to get it in front of an audience. So the thing that I'm writing right now, the the show that I'm producing, um, and I'm actually I've, I've put in for a sabbatical next year so I can focus on this because uh, this is my my next big project. Is it's a it's semi autobiographical. It's about this time, and it takes place over Zoom. And it start, it's going to be a one woman show to start and then maybe we'll workshop it and, and try to move it somewhere else. But it's about my transition and I'm going to use custom built augmented reality filters to, to turn back the clock. So I'm going to start out with a beard. And then over the course of the show, uh, I'm going to end up looking uh, like this or hopefully better by the time the show comes out. Um, and, and it's going to, exp one of the things I'm really interested in right now in the, the augmented reality space is the way in which the horizon has suddenly like smacked us in the face. That, that like we've been talking about AR futures for years and about what is it gonna be like when, when our social interactions are suddenly mediated through these digital overlays and, and that future is so far off, we're gonna need like contact lenses or special glasses to get to that future. And like, that's gonna change everything. And then in March, it was real. And it was in our living rooms, and it was in our offices, it was in our homes. And we aren't talking about the fact that this thing that was purely design fiction, purely hypothetical, is now quotidian, is now part of the landscape of our lives. The fact that Ellen has this virtual background behind her, that I've not once seen the room she's in, that I have to accept this as the reality that she's inhabiting. Like, this is the AR future that we saw on the horizon. We now, we now get to look at it uh, empirically rather than speculatively. And that's cool. Um, I'm interested in a lot of things. Very cool. I mean, it's delightful having you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, yes. And I, I saw like seven people watching on YouTube. So maybe some, some of your students will reach out to you. But yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Okay. I thank you again. And yes, do send information about some of the things you mentioned. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll email you, Ellen. I'll send you Aubrey's dissertation. I have a copy of it, but it doesn't have like a, a title page with his name on it. And I want to make certain he gets attributed properly before I yes. circulate it. Cool. Thank you. And take care. So uh, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks again. Hi, thank you. It's a great talk. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Wonderful. Thank you.